Hello, everyone, and welcome to Med Hedos Nerd Podcast, episode two. I'm your host, Vika Slanyan, and I'm joined by my co host, Mike Balian. How are you doing today? How's it going, guys? Good. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Setian couldn't join us today. He has a very busy schedule, and um, uh, hopefully, he can join us on the next episode, but he is a very busy man. So, uh, um, you know, we're going to do this without him today, which uh, we're going to dive into our topic, which is our Armenian kingdoms. And obviously, we're going to talk about the first Armenian kingdom, which is kingdom of Urartu. But before we uh, dive into the main topic, um, I want to talk about a couple of things in the beginning. First, um, I want to talk about our first episode. Thank you to everyone who listened in. Um, we had such an amazing response um, uh, the subscription is through the roof and, uh, we were actually, uh, some of the countries we were, I think it was like 15 yeah, or something countries. Like just, uh, I have a list here and, uh, besides the United States, we were, um, here, but let me just read this off. We basically, uh, United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, Netherlands, Armenia, Argentina, Germany, France, Mexico. Iran, Cyprus, Lebanon, Sweden, Brazil, uh, Czech Republic, Syria, uh, Sierra Leone. Wow. Sierra Leone, wow. Yeah. Russia, Norway, and Greece. So thank you to everyone who listened to our first episode. Um, we are excited. We want to do this um, every week. And um, if time allows us, we do have a busy schedule with the Med Hedos and project that we do. And... Uh, you know, hopefully uh, we can bring more episodes to you guys uh, on a weekly basis. But if not, <laughs> definitely bi-weekly, I guess. <laughs> We're going to do our best. Um, one of the other things I want to mention is that um, if you follow us on Instagram, uh, we kind of took on a project. We were introduced to an animation studio in Armenia called uh, Popok Animation. They're actually in Gyumri, and they do some amazing work. And we met the uh, the owner of the studio. His name is Arvan. Uh, we were in introduced through Fred, uh, who some of you on Instagram, uh, I think his handle is Goliath. Goliath the, the Great. Goliath the Great, yep. yeah. Um, if so, you don't follow him, follow him. Yeah, definitely. And follow us too, which is at Medhedos. <laughs> <laughs> don't forget about <laughs> us. Yeah, um, so... Um, what what happened is when when we were introduced, you know, they they're kind of in the same realm of what we do here with uh, with the three D uh, sculptures. Well, what Mike does, uh, I'm just a cheerleader here. <laughs> Who said you you can't learn? Um, yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then so basically, uh, what we did is we kind of joined forces, and he had this amazing idea to um, uh, create a school to teach the next generation over there. Uh, how to do uh, 3D animation and 3D sculpting um, and and to basically the idea is for these kids first to have something to do to learn a craft and be able to get uh, decent paying jobs and um, at the same time this is to create an industry to be able to bring um, big studios such as Netflix, Amazon, um, you know Pixar, so you know, so many uh, out there to basically give the projects to these companies in Armenia to outsource work um, to Armenia because there is there's a lot of outsourcing that goes on in the uh, 3D industry, or um, where they send work to India, to Russia, and some of the more prominent Eastern European countries, um, and you know they have a lot of talented artists on that side, and we both know. Armenians are a very talented bunch in terms of anything that that artistic, uh, artistic creative, yeah, yeah. anything. Um, so the goal is to kind of have to put Armenia on the map in terms of with some of the with some of the more major studios like Netflix, like DreamWorks, like or Pixar, some of the more prominent video game studios to outsource work to Armenia because they do really good work. Yeah, we've seen it. And we've seen they're, it. they're already doing good yeah. work for the Russian market. Um, I forgot some of the studios that he'd mentioned. I, I think it was the studio who actually did the new Bagadis. New, 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 new Bagadis, yeah. 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 I forgot what it was called. But yeah, they're they're currently working on a lot of stuff out of Russia. 
And the goal is to tap into the U.S. market and become an outsourcing, you know, country. Yeah. So, so the the idea was, uh, we, you know, Arvan from his side, he, we need uh, computers. So, um, the uh, was it the Gyumri Polytechnic Institute yeah, Gyumri uh, Polytechnic is going Institute. to uh, give one of the labs, and then also the the there's one facility that the Tumo Center used to be in, the one in Gyumri, in Gyumri, yeah, that which they moved out they moved of, out, and yeah. now they've take Popok Animations has taken over that uh, yeah. specific area yeah so we're we uh, we from the medhead osner are donating uh two computers each computer costs about fourteen hundred dollars alvan from his studio is uh, donating three computers we also have henry who uh he the uh, netflix producer henry uh, Hovanissian. yeah henry Hovanissian. Yeah. he's he's going to uh donate another two um and this is all going through miasin.org now those of you who have been on our website the sculptures that we sell Actually, um, uh, $30 from each sculpture goes to miasin.org. And miasin.org is um, what they do is they help displaced, uh, you know, families from the war, the soldiers that have been wounded or their handicap. Uh, amazing organization. Uh, you can actually, if you want to donate uh, any amount, you can go to miasin.org and um, any small amount you can helps. But for this project, the goal is 25 computers, so we have seven, but I think somebody... There's more. There, there's more. They donated. Somebody donated somebody five. Donated five, who's, yeah. Who does, who's anonymous. <coughs> Another person donated two. two. So, so far, we've collected over $20,000, and the goal is to get 35. 35. So, we're about $15,000 away. Uh, so, for that one, you can go to Miasin, and that's spelled M-I-A-S-E-E-N.org forward slash popok and that's p-o-p-o-k and again whatever amount you can um and we're going to split the computers in both labs um and this is going to be free of charge for all the students so all these kids are going to get to learn uh 3d animation uh and 3d sculpting uh for free so it's a great cause uh we're definitely going to be supporting them because our goal eventually is to send our projects over there because our our uh I guess you can call it our sheet of uh, things that we need to do is so much, and Mike by himself can't, you know. Well, yeah. well, ultimately, besides besides, you know, the help in what we're doing, it be I mean an honor and a dream to have our idea be produced in Armenia. I mean, of course, it's great that it's here local. You know, just want to announce that to everybody. We don't make anything outside of the U.S. Everything's made here. Yeah, but and, and but ultimately we would love. It was one of the initial things we discussed. Interestingly en enough, it might come to fruition. Yeah, yeah. That you know? I mean, that's uh, that's our goal. We eventually want to do everything in Armenia to help Armenia to help the economy. Um, so that's pretty much um, the announcements. So uh, our main subject today is the kingdom of Urartu. 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 Um, so, you know, uh, if if you guys don't know, Urartu was the first official, you know, kingdom of of the Armenian highlands. Um, obviously, Armenian highlands was so large, uh, but before the kingdom, there were mostly um, tribes. I guess you can call different, them right? different, different tribes, tribes and different people. Um, I think most of I think they were called the uh, Hayasa Azi. That's mm -hmm. you know, and it was like I think there it was fifteen hundred to twelve hundred BCE. Um, and that they were just local tribes who were Armenian. Um, but then in 9th century BCE, the Urartu kingdom was well, yeah, created, I guess. Created or kind of banded together. Banded together. They were, they were basically three different uh, provinces, if you will. Yeah. You know, one was called um, Ararat, one was called Taik, and the other one was called Naidi. Um, and the... The first king, King Autumn, um, basically kind of banded them together and more or less created. Now, were there like, when you say province, were they own, like had their own kings or were they just like community more or leaders? Less, it's kind of like, it's kind of like how you have, I mean, you know, how we have our own governors in every state, right? Yeah. It, you know, your governor is technically the king of your state. Yeah. If you really think about it. Now, I'm sure they didn't 
refer to these people as governors back then. Yeah. Maybe they did. I know the Romans did. The Romans were, were, were a little bit more organized with their setup. Yeah. Um, so they did have gov governors in different sections of their empire. But I believe they were more or less provinces and they did have their own kings, if you will. Yeah. You know? So, um, I mean, we've done a, as much research as possible um, to, you know, uh, talk about the, uh, the Uratu kingdom. Obviously, it was also um, known as Kingdom of Vaughn because the capital city uh, was near Vaughn Lake. Literally yeah, right on the right shore on the of Vaughn. Shore. Yeah. And uh, it was called... Uh, Dushbavan. Dushbavan. There you go. Yeah. Um, let's see here. So, Which was founded by Sarduri I in 830 B.C., Really? Yes. Okay. I missed that part. <laughs> well, I'm no scholar. I'm yeah. just letting you know. <laughs> so, uh, there are some articles that we might be reading off of just to talk about. Obviously, you know, we're not historians. We're, we're trying to learn. We're um, far from yeah. historians. And um, if you guys, uh, you know, when you listen to this, if, if we might have missed something or if you have a question, again, uh, let us know. You can, you know, uh, send us a question through um, Instagram um i think we're planning to do something with clubhouse next week hopefully maybe sure. have some live audience and and take some questions we're working on it you know it's but new. but another thing another thing i want to touch on is during future podcasts and talking about all this stuff over and over again we're going to touch on a lot of this stuff so yeah. if somebody if you guys want to get involved and be interactive with us you know we more than welcome it because again we're not historical scholars we're maybe trying to be, um, you know, we'll do the research. We'll talk about it. Hopefully it sparks your guys, you know, you guys wanting to do research and, and share notes and sure. Yeah. We'll, we'll accept, we, yeah, we accept we'll, note donations. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, there was an article that by Mark, uh, Cartwright, uh, that I found, which was, uh, I mean, he had really great article written about, uh, Urartu, but is that, is that the one off of, uh, worldhistory.org i think so yeah i think yeah. that's the one good but, website yeah it's a great website i mean i spent hours just trying to uh i mean yeah. there's so much information yeah, where you just treasure trove. Get, yeah <laughs> you get lost yeah. but um just uh, just a small portion from here what he uh he starts off by urarto urarto also known as the kingdom of urarto or kingdom of Van, was a civilization which developed in the bronze and iron age of ancient armenia uh, eastern turkey which we all know that's, you know, Armenian highlands and northwest of Iran from the 9th century BCE, controlling territories through military might and construction of fortresses. The kingdom boasted a lively production in the arts, especially metalwork. That's actually really, I mean, there's some amazing pictures about metalwork that they did. Um, just shows how advanced they were. And and this goes back to our first episode when Vahan was talking about, like, you know, the, the birth of civilization from and how advanced yeah our civilization was yeah. in the Armenian highlands yeah yeah and then um it continues by saying surviving only two centuries which is kind of sad um the kingdom mysteriously disappeared in the sixth century BCE and was only rediscovered as a distinct ancient culture by uh, excavation carried out in the 19th century CE yeah I mean wow that's a d c e yeah Sure. Yeah. Um, so interestingly enough, talking about their metalwork, yeah. right? So they had their the, throughout their two two and a half century reign in the area as the kingdom of Van or Urartu or Urartians. They because the area was so abundant with metals like bronze and and iron. They were amazing craftsmen at the same time and managed to build chariots, spears, javelins, uh, axes, knives, arrowheads. Um, I mean, just, I mean, it was almost like a, like a abundant factory, yeah. a production line of all this military equipment, right? And they, and they found themselves to kind of be the leading army, if you will, or, or, or military force in what what you would call the near east yeah that that area right um they more or less dueled it out with the assyrians 
for so long. And, and, and I'd say, I mean, based on some of the things I've looked into, the Syrians weren't exactly too fond of them. Yeah. Because they were it's sort funny, of afraid. Right? Yeah. yeah and, it's and funny we, that we know, everyone yeah. knows about the Assyrian Empire and how massive yeah. and how, you know, powerful they were. They were. And, and the funny thing about that is like now, if you look at Assyria, which doesn't even exist now, but Assyrian people in general, how close we are with them, with, you know, religion and just what happened to us to, you know, yeah. uh, with genocide and this and that. But um, yeah, Assyrians were their number one threat. It, yeah. It's, it's, to Armenia, they were just like, you know, rivals. Well, they, well, they wanted they wanted what we had, and I'm going to refer to it as we because it's our people, right? They were they were our lands. They've been our lands for for millennia. Yeah, and so they wanted what we had, and typically, you know, it's it's common warfare where we want what you have. Yeah. Speaking of uh, Assyrians or Assyria, um, Urartu comes from Urashtu, the Assyrian word. For the kingdom and signifies high place, uh, possibly referring to either the mountainous region of the cultural uh, culture's common practice of building fortifications on rocks on rock uh, promontories. Um, to the Babylonians, they were urar urar urartri urartri. That's was for the Babylonians, which were the uh, um, Persians, right? Uh, more or less, more or less. Okay, I might be off on that. Sorry, uh, but and then to the Hebrew uh, Hebrews, the kingdom was known as Ararat. Ararat. Uh, the Urarturians called themselves uh, Bia. How do you pronounce Bia-ina. it? Biaina. 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 Or Biaini for, for plural Bia-ina, sense. Yeah. yeah. Or land of the Nairi. Beautiful mm-hmm. name, Nairi. So yeah, so that's where uh, the name Urartu. Uh, that's how it was pronounced. Yeah. They, so, you know, they have a, I think it had something to do with the ancient cuneiform um, from Mesopotamia, um, their form of the cuneiform. And that's that's kind of how they pronounced it um, during those times. And, you know, they had um, different versions depending on where they were from in the in the southern regions, they called them by different letters or different words and whatnot. And apparently in, um, here's some interesting knowledge that I found, um, in Mesopotamia, the vowels A and U with their cuneiform version were commonly altered, which was another way of saying Ararat or Arata. Early biblical texts were found in Palestine, uh, or modern day in Palestine, which confirmed the name Urartu was an altered variation of Ararat or Urarat. See how the a I think Vahan and mentioned U. that on yeah, the last episode. Yeah, we, yeah, we, we, we kind of touched on yeah. some of these points yeah. la- uh, the last time we all spoke. Yeah. Wow. Oh, okay. Um, so this article it continues about prosperity. Uh, Urartu sprang from the confederation of kingdoms, which you mentioned, uh, which had developed from the 14th and 13th 13th century BCE onwards. Um, so yeah. So you you were right. It is. It is. Of course, uh, I was right. <laughs> <laughs> what <are> you, um, <laughs> yeah okay mr historian uh urartu developed from the 9th century bc which combined these smaller kingdoms probably in response to the external threat from the from assyria again these damn assyrians man come on hey man, uh, they, they they had they had a they had a nasty grip in that area for a very, very long yeah. time. They really did. Yeah, no, um, we, we love the Assyrians. Actually, my, my wife is actually quarter Assyrian. In, inter- inter- no. Interestingly enough, I know you kind of read over something that said about the the demise of the Urartu or, or the well, kingdom. We'll get of, to that. Yeah. We'll get to that. Yeah. That's the end. Yeah, yeah. there's, there's a lot of uh, touching points about how okay. the Assyrians yeah. fell as well. Um, and it continues, the culture prospered thanks to... Uh, Settlements, uh, particularly necessary against the attacks from the east and the west, eager to capitalize on the region's wealth. So, I, I mean, they they were you know landlocked uh, as a kingdom. They really, for, I mean, if you for a while, for a while they were. Well, I mean, if you look at the map that they have, they're landlocked. There's really so, so okay. The, the first the first century, the first century of of Urartu's official existence if you will based Mm -hmm. based on the information that we found and based on the information that's out there they look like they were landlocked but then you kind of go forward into 
Argishti Arachin, Argish, Argishti the first, yeah. and then his son that succeeded him, Sarduri the second. And hence why I think, if I'm not mistaken, in in the two century time of the kingdom of Van, we had I believe about nine, eight or nine different kings. And the two that are always mentioned are Argishti and Sarduri. Sarduri the second was Argishti's son and his successor. Argishti the first managed to actually expand the lands, not in a, I guess, kind of took territories. Mm -hmm. So that's why you don't see on the maps, any map that you look for Urartu doesn't extend necessarily to where it's supposed to go. But when you when you really deep dive into it in the areas that they controlled, they controlled as far north as the Caucasus Mountains, which is like basically the border of modern day Georgia and Russia now, um, all the way to the Caspian Sea. Sorry, Azerbaijan. Um, all the way to the Caspian Sea, all the way down to the Persian Gulf, right down to the northern part of the mm -hmm. Persian Gulf, yeah. and all the way to the Mediterra Mediterranean Sea. So think about it. You have four seas that you extended your territories out to. And that was basically what near the reign, uh, near the end of the reign of Argishi I, into his son taking over. And his son even expanded him further until there was some complications near the end of Sarduri II's reign. We'll get to that later. Yeah. But it was a massive, massive kingdom. Massive kingdom. And if you really think about it, the Assyrian Empire and the kingdom of Vaughn at its height were technically considered at the time and in the region two superpowers. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's... Uh, unfortunately, you don't find too many maps that portray the greatness of how big our lands actually were during this time. And it was... Uh, again, I don't, I don't have the dates on it, but it, I think it was about a good 120 to 130 years after the inception of what we would know as the Kingdom of Van or Urartu. Interesting. Very interesting. Okay. So, um... Dropping that knowledge. <laughs> um, that's some good research, man. I'm proud of you. Um, so, uh, and then we want to dive into, like, the government and territory, um, how things were run, what, how their rules and laws were. Um... The government of Urartu functioned around a centralized monarchy with the close circle of advisors and a much larger group of civil administrators who supervised uh, temples and such construction project as fortresses, roads, and canals. Um, the, fortress, the fortress capital, Tushpa, was built on a limestone uh, promontory on the eastern shores of Lake Vaughan in the highlands. So yeah, speaking of that canal, uh, King Menua um, built a 72-kilometer long canal. I mean, 72 kilometers. What is that? 50 miles? Yeah, somewhere around there. That's that's a lot of digging, man. Yeah. They didn't have bulldozers. <laughs> I don't think their shovels and, were. And it's still <laughs> there. And it's still there. Like, they're, it's like the actual canal that was built back then... We're talking 2,900 years ago, man. It's still it's being used? It's still there. Yes, there's water in it. It still goes. I mean, I don't know if they're using it for irrigation purposes, but yeah. that's what it was built for. So it was for irrigation? Absolutely. Okay. I mean, it's you're, the, the only thing you can float on that thing is like a baby dinghy. A, a what? Just a, just oh, a oh, okay. Like yeah. the equivalent of like a power wheel. Oh, got it. Okay. For a kid. Okay. okay. It's right. not very wide, but... That's what it was initially done for. But I mean, 72 kilometers, man. That's a that that's that's crazy, man. I mean, you know, it's amazing 50 what, miles. What, what they did back then. And I'm sure it took a lot of time, but, you know. Uh, and manpower. And manpower. But you also got to look at it like this. They didn't have distractions that we do. <laughs> you know, life. Is... I mean, imagine the life of a, of, a, of a guy that woke up in the morning and dug for a canal. No, yeah, I'm not knocking it. No, no, nah. but you got to think of it. You know, you you're looking at imagine because your day, you wake up, you have your phone, you have your computer, you have your busy life, and this and that. So for you, when you're like, man, can you imagine waking up? But if you were back then, that's all there was. <laughs> yeah, you know. So 
that was part of their I, job and they got paid for that and it was for the greater and good who knows, for the entire and, and country. Again, I didn't I didn't really deep dive into the the th process or what they used or what type of manpower they used, but who knows, maybe they were slaves that they took over from a different um you know yeah. from from some sort of conquest or something like that, right? Um who knows? Who knows what type of labor or laborers they used? So um, it continues over here. Uh, Tushpa would later be called Van and perhaps had the population as high as 50,000 at its peak. So for the for the, uh, Tushpa, the city of Van, I guess. When uh, The thing is, did it change after a certain time they start calling it Van? Or was it just some people called it Van, some people called it Tushpa? I know I, I've seen... References of it being called just Tushpa, but mm -hmm. a lot of, I've, I mean, I remember it from any of the history lessons that I learned, you know, going to Armenian institutions when I was younger was you called it Tushpa Van. But again, I don't think there's a specific preference. I'm not sure. Um, okay. Something worth looking into. Yeah. Next episode. Um, email us. Email us. <laughs> Let us know. Let us know. Um, the kingdom's first known monarch was Arame who reigned in uh, 860 to 840 BCE, just 20 years. Uh, a Syrian source mentioned that the kingdom first rose to prominence from uh, 830 BC under the King Sarduri I, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, reigned from 835 to 825 BC, 10 years, uh, whose descendants would rule for the next two centuries. Um, in 776 BCE, Argishti I, uh, who ruled from 785 to 760 BCE, um, which is 25 years, would uh, found a new city, Argishtihanili. Wow, that's that's yeah. a mouthful. Which is, basically, which is basically Ottoman Beach. Yeah, on the plain of Ararat, uh, later to become the second city of the kingdom and renamed Ottoman Beach. There you go. Good job, Mikey. <laughs> <laughs> if only you guys could see my yeah. face right now. Then in 685 BCE, King Rusa II, uh, who ruled from 685 to 645 BCE, that's quite some time, found, founded the important northern city of Teishab... Oh, man. These are... Uh, yeah, I Teisha, had a feeling. Teishabaini, uh, which is modern Yerevan. Yeah, I'm, yes. I'm glad they changed it to Yerevan. Also on the, <laughs> <laughs> also on the Ararat Plain. Other important Uratu centers were uh, Bastama, Karmid Bluj, uh, Ad Adli Sevaz, and uh, Yanis. Man, and, in, um, and, in, and interestingly enough, yeah. there's still excavations going on in some of these cities in Karmid Bluj. Yeah. There's a massive excavation going on there um, till present day. There's a lot of things that they've recently discovered. I mean, a lot of the stuff we're talking about, like decoding their cuneiform, um, and and let me uh, sure. just one thing let me cut you off when you say excavation is it being done by Ar armenian ar archaeologist or is it by you know it's i mean look archaeology isn't something that has boundaries i don't think so at least i don't know i'm not in the archaeological world but i'd be curious to find out if let's say Hey, look, Vic, you are an Italian archaeologist. And hey, I am a Armenian archaeologist. And let's say because the Roman Empire was so prominent in, you know, uh, the Anatolia region, the western part of modern day Turkey, yeah. I'm sure the Turkish government isn't going to have. And again, I'm not defending the Turkish government. I just let's let's speak yeah. reality isn't going to not allow Italian archaeologists to go in and dig in places like Gobekli Tepli or or Cappadocia, right? Some of the more prominent historical places in the western well, no, part of Turkey. The, the reason I asked that question was I, I prefer for it to be an international, it's, it's an, international it, absolutely. It's an international you know, effort. effort rather than just Armenia because, you know, the biggest problem we have right now is uh, the amount of information that there is in Armenia from the yeah. museums and, and yes, you know, and the uh, archives. And, that no one knows about. They don't share it. And, you know, we touched on this with Vahan on the last episode, which is there's amazing historical books that have not been translated. Yeah. And if they were, I think the world would know more about our history and the things we've done. So 
I hope that's what's happening. And it's not just Armenians in Armenia doing it. Inter- interestingly enough, to touch on what you're saying, I mean, you know, obviously it is an international, it has to be an international international effort. Um, a lot of the stuff that has been recovered that has to do with Urartu um, or the Urarti- Urartians is kind of scattered at different types of museums in different countries. We're talking about there's there's a there's a, a helmet apparently that they are for sure or for certain that belonged to Argishti Arachin Argishti the first found in the Caucasus mountains in a chamber in some sort of like burial chamber where some sort the the story goes and this is based off of an actual cuneiform inscription so there is written proof that this helmet was found in a burial chamber in the Northern Caucasus, which is modern day Georgia. Yeah. Because that's how far, as I was mentioning earlier, the Northern part of the, I guess we could call it an empire yeah. or the kingdom yeah. had extended. Yeah. And it is the helmet of Argishti the first. And that helmet is in some museum in, in the UK. Wow. So, I mean, and you're not, you know, think about it. Like yeah. th- there's obviously got to be English archaeologists who are, have, have interest because they're historians and archaeologists that are finding things in these regions. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, that's the only the other sad part about this situation is because, you know, there's other countries in our historical lands. So whatever uh, digs that are happening, whatever they find, as much as it could be from our history, you know, they're. They're kind of using it for their own benefit, um, and um, we have to make sure that it's it's promoted the right way. Sure, that, you know. Again, I don't care what anybody says. Uh, Eastern Turkey is Armenia. Period. Well, I mean, like seventy percent of what Turkey is today is is. I'm just. Armenia. I'm not going to go seventy percent. I'm going to say Eastern. I mean, Turkey. Uh, we're not is knocking Armenia. it. Yeah, we're, we're not. not we're, that's we're, we're, reality. We're being, we're being realists and, here. And you know, I'll tell you one thing. Um, my parents, I think it was about five years ago, um, they went on this uh, tourist group thing, and they went to Turkey. They went to see their, you know, because my ancestors are um, uh, from Antip. 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 That's, that's how they pronounce it. Antip. Yeah. So, you know, they went to kind of see their whole uh, historical lands and this and that. And she was saying, like, when when they actually landed in uh, Istanbul and um, as they took the bus and they were going from, you know, obviously it's a long trip. So they're they're staying at different cities and and they ended up going through like Adana, Mm Vaughn and so forth. Um, Oh, they got to visit Vaughn? Yeah. Yeah, Man. yeah, it's um, we'll talk about there's that videos. It's amazing. So, and anyway, not not to dive too deep into it. And she was saying, but as we were going more east, you could see how undeveloped it is. It, and I feel like they're doing that on purpose, you know, because so, like one day they got to give that well, shit back to well, us. Well, um, I mean, a lot. I of hope the, so. A lot of the, I mean, in the, I, I guess you want to call it the middle of Turkey, if, if is Ankara, their capital, right? Yeah. It's, I've been on that road for one of the hockey tournaments I told you that yeah. we went on. Yeah. You know, we had, because the border was closed between Armenia and Turkey, we had to drive from Yerevan north into Georgia through Tbilis and then into Batum, which is a resort city on the, literally right on the border of Georgia and Turkey. And then you enter Turkey and we drove on the northern coast of Turkey along the Black black sea and then finally you go back in to like you dive back down south into ankara a lot of that land is between mountains so a lot of that land you have a lot of hills and valleys it's kind of like what we have here in california when you're thinking about like the the you know the sierra sierra mountains and then you have that great basin that kind of just massive nothingness when you go towards bakersfield let's say yeah right it's just flat flat lands it's basically the same thing, um, but a lot more mountainous. Um, and when you look at, let's say, anything outside of the coastlines of Turkey, it's fairly under underdeveloped. Now, I wouldn't say third world, but it's just not as populated as anything along the coast. Think, yeah. you know, ports, a lot more merchants, things like this, you know, commerce. Yeah. 
No, it's just interesting. Like, uh, you know, why would you develop one part and not the other? But anyways, that's another episode. Going back, is there any other uh, points you want to make? No, no, no. no. Okay. I don't care what that topic was. So um, uh, the next uh, topic, I guess, as far as Urartu goes, we're going to talk about warfare. Um, so this article talks about uh, all Urartu kings seem to have led their armies in battle, which is amazing. You know, so, you know, a lot of kings could be sitting there and... Uh, yeah, they were all just, warrior kings, man. Yeah, that That's the that's the amazing. That's when we talk about the warrior, that Armenian yeah. blood, you know. Um, they didn't leave their guys on the field and just uh, sit in their kingdom. and We can them be a stubborn bunch. Yeah. So weapons, as indicated by those dedicated at temples, include iron and bronze swords, spears, and javelins, as well as bows. Um, heavy shields were used, which had large central uh, boses, I guess, boses, boses, decorated with images of mythical creatures, bulls, and lions. There is also evidence of helmets and metal scale armor, at least worn by the elite. So, you know, the higher, I guess, elite. Which is pretty crazy because, I mean, you would think based off of some of the more known history that we have, right? The Romans were so prominent with their armor. Things we've seen in video games and, and movies forever, for decades. Yeah. But these guys were craftsmen. I mean, serious craftsmen based on some of the images that I've seen as well. The chief uh, advisory was the Neo-Assyrian Empire, although there is also evidence of trade relations between the two states. Given the use of chariots by the Assyrians, it would seem reasonable to support that their advisory also employed them, especially given Urartians' fame for horse breeding. Oh, oh. yeah. Or horse guess. breeders too. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you you kind of have to be right. You know, what's what, I mean? You don't have to be. Well, I mean, think, <laughs> you can well, always well, dig well, a channel. Listen, I mean, a four, yeah, a, a <laughs> fifty mile long channel, sure. Um, but you know, no pressure, none whatsoever. Um, it, you're ruling for two two centuries plus. You know, how are you like? You know, how long, I mean, I, I don't know what, what, how long horses typically live, but you're going to have to replace these horses with proper horses as your time goes along. You know, it should be common. I mean, it, logically speaking, it's a, it's common practice. Yeah. You know? Well, uh, it continues by, it says, Urartu did enjoy some victories in the mid-8th century BC, but the Assyrian, again, the Assyrian, Assyrian ruler uh, Tiglath, Pileser, Tiglath Pileser the third. Tiglath Pileser the third. The third was more aggressive than his predecessors, and he laid siege on Tushba. Another significant conflict between the two states was during the campaign of Sargon II in 714 BCE. Other enemies of Urartu include the Sumerians, uh, Scythians, and finally the Medes. Yeah, they were. Uh, interestingly enough, this guy. So I'm not too fond of this Tiglath Pileser guy, um, but he's a smart fella, and I'll tell you why. Because he managed to win some battles and push the Urartians back, and then he retreated for whatever reason. But he didn't really retreat. It was it was a fascinating war tactic. So he goes out and he basically sacks our. Um, I keep saying our. Um, one of our holiest sites at the time, which was a temple that we had dedicated to the god Haldi, right? Which was the main god, the supreme god, during this time that the Urartians or the kingdom of Vaughn would worship. He went in and sacked the place and stole all this gold, all this, all this weaponry, like you were mentioning yeah. earlier, where they stored some of this stuff was in temples. Um I guess it was kind of a uh, makeshift armory, if you will. I mean, thousands upon thousands of, of, of these weapons, thousands upon thousands of these shields. And, and I mean, you name it, the guy took off with, right? Wow. And then came back. And in this time, he managed to cause enough damage to the southern part of Urartu, or the kingdom of Vaughn, where he managed to get himself to uh, Dushbavan. And wow. I believe, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, take over, take over control of Dushbavan. So is that where 
Well, I mean, we'll get into it. Is that where the kind of demise of Urartu started? It, I mean, based off of based off of the the timelines, it looks like that's where it kind of started. Kind of the downfall. Uh, yeah, yeah, more or less, more or less. And this was this was after the height of, you know, after after what Argish the first and his son yeah. Sarduri the second had managed to accomplish. This is well after that. Yeah, and well, it was near the end of Sarduri the second's reign. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, speaking of the of the of that temple and and uh, God, what was his name? Haldi. Haldi. God Haldi. So, um, r- as far as religion, um, you know, their their whole thing was offering uh, of food, weapons, and precious goods, uh, wine, and animal sacrifices were all made to the gods in dedication and uh, and dedicated outdoor ritual spaces at uh, uh, false doorways carved into rock face, which were known as gates to the gods mm-hmm. and and gates to the gods like you said there's one specific place so in the eastern part of turkey in some of the mountaintops or carved into the rock they had cuneiform inscriptions all over the place we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit when we touch on some of the languages that um they had specifically for this region and they had a doorway called the door of Mahej which was kind of like a gateway to the god or gods. And in this inscription, I mean, it's it's pretty crazy looking the way the way they managed to carve into what looks like granite stone. You think about it, how did they manage to do this? And way? I heard it's very precise. I mean, it's I mean, if if I had a granite slab in my backyard, I'd want something that looked like this. I'm not going to lie. You know, if if they had the ability to do this and they carved in in cuneiform the the description of all of the gods in detail in fine detail of every single god that they had in their deity at the time everybody that they believed in and uh, what was it how many how many gods did they i think they had like 79 yeah, gods it or was, something like that yeah um I'll, I'll i'll find there's a small article about that but this continues to say the um the panth- uh, pantheon of urartu religion contains mix of unique and uh, Hurian gods such as the god of storm and thunder, uh, Teish- Teisheba? 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 I don't know if I'm excuse sorry. us for butchering. Yeah, some sorry of these guys. Names. Um, I'll do better next time. Teisheba, uh, f- uh, for the Hurian Teshub. Okay, uh, the mid uh, ninth century BC King Ishpuini. Ishpuini, man, I gotta work on these. Ishpuini uh, promoted right. uh, Haldi, uh, promoted Haldi to the head of the gods. So wait a minute, they promoted their gods? I guess. Uh, okay. I mean, Haldi, Haldi was the god of sky, war, and Yeah, it herds. says, uh, yeah. Um, although his role and function are obscure besides that, he was associated with warfare. Haldi is often portrayed as a man standing on a bull or a lion, symbolic for his power. And you guys can actually... Uh, uh, Google that, and it's a yeah, pretty it's, cool picture. Yeah, I mean, the carving of it is is amazing. But um, to talk about the, I think it was something about the seventy nine gods. So as far as the uh, the gods, uh, it talks about here the list inscribed in uh, duplicate mentions seventy nine gods and the various sacrifices which should be made to each. So they had seventy nine gods, and they had different types of sacrifices for each god it's a lot of work and and from what i what i understand is they sacrificed female animals for female goddesses and male god uh, animals for male gods and it was a strict practice hmm. interesting why i, I don't know why <laughs> i don't know why no. i'm not into animal sacrifices so yeah but it, it continues talking about here how uh the you know haldi was the, the the main god i guess yes. the god of gods which he was the god of war the equivalent uh, of their zeus yeah you yeah, know pretty much so that's i think that's pretty much it as far as uh religion goes so uh the next uh paragraph or subject i guess would be the architecture of the urartu kingdom um the urartians were innovative and ambitious architects uh, significant construction projects include the 80-kilometer-long stone-lined canal, which brought fresh water for the Artos Mountain to uh, the capital. So, 
you know, you got to argue about this with him because you said it was 72. Look, that's he based on 80. my research. So maybe okay. if you guys, uh, if you guys want to see us fight, email us. <laughs> hey, the guy says, lady, I don't know. I'm just reading his article. Um, the structure was built by King uh, Manua, who reigned in 810 to 785 BCE uh, and allowed the proliferation and allowed the proliferation of vineyards and uh, um, orchids, resulting in Tushpa gaining and reputation as a garden city. See, this is where we're so good at making wine. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about going back that far yeah. where and they made wine. I mean, again, irrigation for a lot of these valleys, right? And now you're growing grapes. You're growing. You're 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 basically having prosperous and 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 look, fertile lands. The Armenian highlands were very fertile lands yeah. because of all the rivers, because of a lot of the lakes, and the the ability that these people had back then to to make these irrigation ditches. I mean, I, I well, ha- you know, you say that because that is you know, Eastern Turkey now. And a lot of the export fruit goes out from there. Yeah. Is the most delicious fruit and, and vegetables. I mean, you're talking about tomatoes. Non-GMO. You know? Yeah. Well, but the <laughs> po- the point is that, you know, be- you're right. It was so fertile till this day. Still is. That's where the agriculture of, of all the fruits and the vegetables, everything goes from the Eastern Turkey and exports out. And people are amazed by it. But that is Armenia. Yeah, it's you know it's it's a mountainous region. You have a lot of water coming out of the mountains from molten snow. I mean, we've we've gone through this. I don't have to explain it to anybody, but you know you have that much silt running downstream and depositing on the banks of every single river, and then you build irrigation ditches. And you know, depending on the weather, you have fertile lands, nonstop fertile lands. It just doesn't end, right? Um, I know there were some areas that maybe may have been dry, but again, this is where irrigation came in, like very primitive. I guess you want to call it primitive irrigation, but um, it wouldn't be difficult for these people to grow anything that they desired to, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, he continues talking about here, um, although little remains from uh, Urartu fortifications, one of the most significant and best preserved fortresses is the Erebuni near today's capital of Armenia, Yerevan. Um, built by Argishti the I. Built during the reign of King Argishti the I. Uh, impressive section of the fortification walls still stand today. Uh, typical features of Urartu fortifications are massive walls supported by stone foundations made of large square blocks. And um, in Assyrian relics of Urartu fortification, these two towers are crenellated and have windows. Their survival since antiquity is a testimony on the building skills of the Urartians, especially considering the region as subject for frequent and powerful earthquakes. So, I mean, you're talking about architecture that they they knew that earthquakes happened. So, you know, it's like kind of like modern how they have these spring systems in, in high-rise buildings, mm-hmm. which if so, yeah, they uh, obviously they didn't have that, but they did consider that earthquake. So they made them really heavy to possibly withstand that movement of the earth. What's interesting is this had to be built sometime around the seventh century BC, right? Think about it; it's twenty-eight to twenty, well, twenty-eight hundred plus years old, mm-hmm. and I visited it. Um, I've been to the Erebuni Fortress um, in, what was it, 2010. I mean, a lot of the lay, I mean, the lay of the land, like the way it looks architecturally, if you were to look at the, if I call it the blueprints, maybe, yeah. you can kind of see where all the walls are and how you would, let's say, maneuver around the place and walk around, if if you will. Um, it's really interesting that it still stood the test of time, Um and man, what an absolutely amazing view of Ararat! I mean, seriously, it's perfect. I've I've, I've never been. It's back on a hilltop. Yet. Yeah, yeah, it's on a um, hilltop. So it's you know, from what my parents told me is they took me when I was a kid, but I don't remember. So, but definitely, uh, that's one spot I need to go to, and hopefully next summer. Um, continuing, it says um, uh, palace buildings are uh, composed of multiple chambers and larger halls 
um, the former uh, the former usually with the roof supported by a cent- uh, centrally placed wooden column and the latter by multiple rows of columns. Other features are open courtyards and storerooms where large uh, pottery j- uh, jars were s- uh, sunk into the floor to hold flood stuffs. Interesting. I uh, thought of everything. Wine and beer. I mean, they had to reward their laborers. Right, isn't that what we know uh, with modern mainstream history about the Egyptians, where they were they were gifted uh, Beer, yeah. a jug of ale, ale at yeah. the end of their shift, if you want to call it yeah, that. Yeah, you know, man, must have been nice. I mean, if that was your reward back then, what else would there be? It's not like I'm just I'm just saying, like that was very, you know. I mean, I'm it, sure it, they it, paid him too, right? It wasn't just. I like, don't know. I mean, I I don't know about. I don't know about. I thought you were a historian, man. I I am not anything of the such. So another thing I want to talk about is um, the languages. Here's a really really interesting thing, and I found this probably the most fascinating part about some of the research that I've done over the past week is the initial languages of the Kingdom of Ararat was multilingual. He used three different languages with its own. With like and it, you know each each one had its own. Wait, wait, wait. Languages or dialects? Dialects. Okay. Um. So. Um. King Ishpuini, son of Sarduri the first, mm-hmm. created their own cuneiform writing system. Took basic cuneiform from Mesopotamia, and kind of played God with it, if you will. Um took the so so the way it's written right mm-hmm. you've seen the way we've all seen what cuneiform looks like it's it's a it's a line with triangles and whatever and the more lines with triangles means something else or at least this is my primitive understanding of it yeah. um it underwent a change from mesopotamia was modified from the babylonian cuneiform was around 600 which was around 600 characters it simplified the system to just 200 characters had its own numbering system, which until this day has... So around the region, in that region, the Armenian highlands, or or what's now northern part of what was then the Persian Empire and now is Iran, and parts of Azerbaijan. Sorry, Azerbaijan. I'll say sorry. I'm, I knew you were going to say that. but um, And in Georgia and whatnot, in the mountains... A lot, they had 1,000, I, I think according to what they found, is 1,350 inscriptions, cuneiform inscriptions, where, that have full proof um, of, of all of this, all of these facts, right? So the Urartian cuneiform system was the most abundantly found writing system in the, in the entire region. Apparently, it was so simple to use and and... A lot of the people in and around the area began to adopt this, and it was kind of used for official documentation, if you will, because they wrote on stone tablets. So any sort of official, um, call it letters or whatever the case it may, it may be, um, or historical references or whatever the case is, was used. Uh, they used this Urartian cuneiform um, as the main way to talk to one another. And it was adopted by a bunch of the tribes or whoever was a part of the kingdom back then. So it became like this um, main way to speak. It's kind of like how English is the most spread language on yeah, the planet, yeah. right? That's kind of how Urartian version of cuneiform, which again, let me reiterate, they established their own version of cuneiform according to the research that, that we've done Um to communicate with one another and it kind of spread far and wide um so interestingly enough from that version of cuneiform during the von king or kingdom of von um we have a lot of words that are not necessarily translated but sound almost the same so if you really think about it some of the words not some a lot of the words that we use today when we speak armenian mm-hmm. are more or less derived from that time era off of this this version of cuneiform for instance abeli abeli more mm-hmm. 
Um, let's see what else. Um, Iwi, Ev, Yev, yeah, and and Yev, yeah. You know. Um, let's see. Haluli, Halol, Charog, Halol, Charog. I mean, it's very yeah. similar to the pronunciation. It's not exactly. We don't have. The, of course, yeah. yeah I grapes. mean, it's the same thing when you if you go to Artach, like you know, or, the or Artach Harar, is, yeah. Harar, Halal, peace. Yeah. Right. So a lot of these words are derived from that ancient form of cuneiform. And I know Vahan, Dr. Vahan had mentioned this last week when we spoke of how a lot of our modern day language, um, everything that we use on a daily basis, I, I personally didn't know. But now, you know, kind of discovering where this all, like these yeah. sequence of events that led to this. Yeah your mind's blown. You're like, wait a minute, we've been using these words in the same part of that world for 2,800, 3,000 years, maybe it's even not longer. even longer because yeah. this is, you're talking about this right now. We're talking about the, the Uratu kingdom. Yes. Which, you know, you talk about the timeline, but obviously Armenians have been in the highlands. What? I mean, they're going back to 18,000 years. Yeah. And so they, obviously they spoke some language, of course, which might've changed here and there, but, some, some alterations some alterations but that was the main i mean the, the roots are still there yes so you're talking about if you think about it again i could be wrong but uh you're talking about a language that has survived you know eighteen thousand plus years i mean that's i mean and, and and you guys can go check this out yourselves um you know or, or email us to, to maybe want to, if you guys want us to send you some of this stuff, you know, we'll yeah. gladly do it. But um, again, this, this information isn't like hidden. Um, it's just not taught. It's not talked about. Um, or yeah. yeah, talked about. And I yeah. wouldn't say, I wouldn't say it's hidden, but I mean, who knows? Who knows? It could be hidden on purpose. We don't know because look, I mean, some of the, some of the things that we've researched thinking about some of this stuff is for that time era to have two, I mean, we've, we've heard everything about the Assyrians. We've heard everything about the Romans. We've heard everything about the Persians, but nobody other than I want to say us or archeological experts or professionals don't really talk about the Uratu kingdom. And I mean, from the sound of it, there it was like a massive superpower. Yeah, in that I mean, region. two centuries, that's, that's a long time, you know, that, that, yeah. that was a superpower in that region. And, you know, again, everyone, this is, you know, this is something that Mike and I have researched. Um, and, and this is the whole point of this is to talk about this. So while you're listening and if you have any interest about the Urartu kingdom or kingdom of Vaughan, go do research yourself, learn about it. And you know what? If you have questions, uh, send it to us. We'll research with you and, and yeah. answer on the next episode. And it's... Um, you know, and, and there were some questions that we're going to answer on, also, on, at the end. One, one, one last thing I want to touch on. One last thing I want to touch on. They also had their own arithmetic system, which is really fascinating. I think maybe yeah. even more so than the language. And yeah. look, I'm not a math junkie. I'm not whatsoever, right? But they're, they had their own system of using dots and circles and different types of, um, I guess not drawings, but images yeah. to depict certain types of numbers, which was not derived from anything of the sort. It was just kind of, well, somewhat derived of cuneiform, but they took cuneiform lettering and turned it into a numbering system, right? And then they, in essence, went away from what the ancient Egyptians used, what the Hittites used, and what... Um, was generally used in that part of the world, which was one little dash or a stripe meant one. Two stripes or dashes meant two. Basic stuff, right? Basic yeah. arithmetic. But a, but according to a lot of the stuff that I looked into, we had our own numbering system, which is kind of fascinating. Like, yeah. who does that? The number, number Numbers are universal. Well, who does that? Armenians do that. Because they, <laughs> they go, you know man, what? Man can't call it. Yeah. Uh, I don't like how you're doing yeah. that. I'm going to come up with my version. Yeah. So it's it's super fascinating. Again, um, you know, we, we can do a little bit more research. You guys can do a little bit more research and find out about this. But I think one of the most fascinating things I found out was the arithmetic system. Um, it's a little mind-blowing, to say the least. Yeah. That's amazing. 
Um, well, uh, having said that, the last portion, we're going to talk about the decline of the this amazing kingdom, which is, uh, uh, is sad. But um, the article continues. It says, um, in the 7th century BC, the Urartu kingdom came to a mysterious but violent end when sometime between 640 to 590 BCE, the cities were destroyed. You're talking about 50 years. So in a 50-year period, this kingdom was destroyed. Um, the state was probably weakened by decades of battles with the Assyrians. Damn, man, these Assyrians. Yeah, um, they just don't go away. <laughs> but wait, there's, there's good news um, on that front. Yeah. Um, and it may have been too uh, too overstretched to control its own empire. So that 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 actually goes back to what you were talking about. How you know uh, we have this map of Urartu, but you know uh, how it was extended out to further. So obviously, the bigger you are, the harder you fall. Um, that's with any empire. You know that, that's why empires have well, fallen. Well, you know, a lot of those, like, and, and hence why I touched on it earlier, and I said it, they were just territories. They were expansions of the current state of what was, of what course. was a fortified Urartu. They were extensions, but it extended so far out. I, again, I don't know. But you know have what, to manage that, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, I don't know how course, the governance yeah. system was. I'm not sure how that works. But it, again, you, you, you said it where it kind of overgrew itself and you had a lot of people at some point i'm sure they probably formed alliances the assyrians had some help from the chimerians or known as the sumerians from the north so you know. so th- th- you saying that it talks about it says the uh um the as far as the enemies that they would have had that destroyed in this 50 year period would have been the uh, scythians are one candidate the sumerians another which you know, Dr. Uh, Setian is, I think he's writing a book about the Sumerians possibly mm-hmm. being Armenians, but um, kind of like their own, a different version of Armenians. I don't know how to yeah. put it, but yeah. another race of Armenians, I guess. But uh, which, you know, uh, that would be sad if they, they, they're with the reason. But uh, another possible force from within the territories uh, by the Urartu kings. So... Again, they that goes, had that goes back to issues. yeah. That yeah. goes back to territories. I'm sure they had many kings here and there. You know, yeah, um, and some sort of power grab or whatever yeah, the case is. Yeah. But that that's all hearsay. Again, there's a, apparently there isn't enough evidence to suggest um, one major pitfall to why why the the kingdom fell. Yeah, and and I, I guess there's been some finds of of three pronged arrowheads. Uh, which belonged to the Scythian archers. Uh, they were f- found in these destroyed areas uh, of 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 uh, of the kingdom. Which God, is, who, who yeah. thinks of making three pronged arrowheads? Yeah, that's pretty nasty. Yeah. So again, that that when they found this, that indication that it could have been. That's clues. what they're saying. They're, it could have been clues. one of the other yeah. clues. Yeah. Um, the destruction of the city by fire sometime between fi- uh, 594 and 590 BCE seems to have been unexpected, with granaries recently filled and weapons and precious belongings seemingly abandoned in a hurry. So something major happened where they just left everything and just kind of rushed out. So the the one thing that I came across was um, apparently Babylonia or the Babylonian Empire once they managed to take out the Assyrians, at the same, almost the same exact time, the Urartians disappeared, according to whatever we can find. So it, it almost was synonymous or simultaneous that the Urartians and the Assyrians both... Ve- well, the Assyrians were conquered and taken out, but the Urartians were, I guess, call it vanished lack for a better term, right when the Babylonians take took out the Assyrians. Now one can one can speculate that the Babylonians had everything to do with I it. I don't think they vanished. I think just the kingdom J- fell. You yeah. Know? Yeah. But I, I mean if they vanished, we wouldn't uh, be here. Well so. yeah, not vanished. Lack for a better term. But um again, it's they they were almost simultaneous, if you will. Yeah. Um, so it says, uh, it's likely that the various cities of Urartu succumbed at different times to different 
uh, peoples over a period of two or three decades. So it was it was a kind of a slow, gradual, I guess you can say. Um, it 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 started it started at the the reign of um, Sarduri the second. You know there was there was issues that he had um, politically, and being attacked from all sides because look any any empire look at look throughout history any empire that grows and grows and grows everybody's trying to take you out mm-hmm. right it's just basically what happened and and when you occupy an area that's so rich in natural resources and you know a fertile lands why not everyone's going to take a stab at you yeah yeah no you're right um and 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 the last paragraph here that that um, is pretty much the end of what happened is uh, the territories of Urartu kingdom had once occupied were ultimately taken over by the Medes from 585 BCE onwards and then incorporated into the Achaemenian Empire of Cyrus the Great Cyrus the Great in, in the mid sixth century BCE. The Urartian language, however, would survive into the Hellenistic period. So they, they were at least able to preserve their, their, their language and keep it. Many Urartian towns would become the lo- uh, location of important settlements throughout antiquity, and many of their Urartu names survive today. Unrecorded and unknown to ancient Greek historians, Urartu would have to wait until archaeological excavation in the 19th century CE to take its place as an important regional Bronze Age culture. Yeah, we were kind of awesome back then. Yeah, yeah. And it's sad. Kind of, very awesome. Uh, you know, that that's the thing that it, it's so sad that it took that long for them to be able to kind of have recognition of what who they were as people and, and their uh, the kingdom, the might of the kingdom. You know, two hundred years again is 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 a long time, and especially in that region, because you know you have. I mean, when you think about that area, you always think about you know the Great Roman Empire. You always think about the Persian Empire of that time, and you always think about the Babylonians, the Assyrians, and the Greeks. You don't think about anything else. Yes, we, I mean, we as Armenians, we know that we occupy that area, but to what extent? I'm not going to lie. After the research that we've been doing this past week, yeah, I mean, I'm mind blown as to how large and how prominent our, like, the, the, the kingdom of Van and, or Urartu actually was. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Truly. It's amazing. Um, and how advanced they were. <clears throat> yeah. Well, um, that's pretty much, uh, you know, I know we try to get into it as, as detailed as possible, but we're just kind of following, um, you know, kind of like segments of about this, this amazing kingdom. And, and uh, um, obviously we can go far deeper, but that would be a four hour podcast. Um, so hopefully you guys learned something. Uh, again, I hope this was interesting enough. And, and, and our goal is to encourage you to go do your own research uh and share with us uh um, questions you have again you can email us at pod at medhedosner.com uh that's p-o-d at med m-e-r hedosner h-e-r o-s n-e-r i was i was get confused that dot com um and then uh on our instagram which is uh at medhedosner um yeah that's well, we don't have a Twitter account yet, so no, I don't. I don't think we're gonna do Should that. Should we get a TikTok? Uh, no, <laughs> I'm not doing any TikTok <laughs> dances. Um, but yeah, let us know uh, if you have any questions. From the last episode, uh, we had two questions. Uh, one was, I think it was more, it it was kind of a more of a recommendation and a question. One was like, how often are you gonna, guys going to be doing this? Uh, again, I, I mentioned this in the beginning of the episode that our goal is to do this weekly, but uh, it all depends on our schedule, uh, availability. Uh, we are really busy, guys. Uh, besides the MedHedosNet projects that we do, and there's many of them, uh, we also have our own separate careers. 
Um, so, uh, you know, time to research and talk about this. But again, our goal is weekly, if not weekly, at least biweekly uh, episodes. Plus, we, you know, we would uh, we want uh, Dr. Setian to be with us. He is very busy. He travels a lot. So um, hopefully he'll be with us in the next episode. And look, we're 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 planning on um, we've reached out to multiple, multiple historians. Having said that, the other question was, are you guys going to have guests, historians, especially from Armenia and Arta? Yes. And the question is and the answer is yes. yes. And we're yes. trying we're trying to reach out to so many uh, historians. Uh, the other thing is uh, we, you know, lo- the historians that we want to speak to also need to speak English. We want this to be in English because if we do in Armenian, um, we, you know, we want this to be in English for a reason. Uh, and that is for uh, other uh, nationalities to listen and learn about our history, to have that interest to to go do research about, for example, who this this big, you know, what was this empire about? Um, and you can also YouTube. There's a lot of great documentary about the Urartu kingdom on yeah, YouTube. Yeah, so, I, found, I found one that was absolutely gold. I mean, yeah. what a great production it was. Yeah. So again, if uh, oh, we've mentioned it a couple times, if you guys want some of these links, email us. Put in a request, we'll, we'll gladly send it to you. Um, you know, no problem. But um, in terms of the historians we're going to get, we will have these guests. Um, we're, we're hopeful that we can get um, some of these people on to, again, we're not, we're not histor we're not historians. We're not historical scholars. We're just doing this research just like any one of you would. Yeah. Um, and talking about it and talking about it. Yeah. Um, and you know, we're hoping that you guys would want to get involved in asking questions that'll spark our interest further into doing yeah. this research. Yeah. Cause we're, we're again, like Vic said, we're doing this out of our own time um because it's a passion this is amazing this is fun we're learning more and more about our culture and our and our history and our roots um and we're hoping to spark that in every single one of you yeah and for you uh you know later on to pass it on to your children friends family uh you know when you're gathered around the table instead of talking about uh, current affairs and nonsense uh spark a new conversation about our great history kingdoms kings uh you know any era so make it a dinner table conversation that's our goal um having said that um i think that's pretty much it for this episode uh i hope you guys enjoyed it uh sorry if we've made some mistakes but again it's a learning period and um we we are hopeful that we'll have uh more guests and um i think Next episode, we might end up doing it uh, a live clubhouse room. We're working on it. We're trying, but you know, we'll we'll see. We might. Um, we might eventually. Have, we might have some uh, things that we're working on, yeah. and we might touch on some Alexander the Great. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, having said that, till next time. Till next time, guys. Thank you. Take care. <laughs>